Today we're joined by uh, Major General uh, Rupert Jones from the British Army. General Jones is the Deputy Commanding General for Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve in Baghdad, Iraq. Well, General good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining today. I'm going to give you quick operational and stabilization updates for Iraq and Syria before touching on a couple of points about the strength of the coalition to defeat, to defeat Daesh. As you know, in the early hours of Sunday morning, Iraqi security forces launched their latest offensive against Daesh, starting the attack on Talafa. The liberation of this city and the remainder of Nineveh province will essentially end ISIS's military presence in northern Iraq. All the branches of the Iraqi security forces are taking part in this operation. Three Iraqi army divisions, the Counterterrorism Service, the Federal Police, the Emergency Response Division, the Iraqi local police, as well as, well as popular mobilization forces, all under the command of Prime Minister Bardi. They've made a really positive start, but we should expect it to be a tough fight. As always, the coalition will be in there in support, providing equipment, training intelligence, precision, air and ground artillery fires, and combat advice. There's still much to do once Talafa is liberated. Daesh must be driven from Hawija, as well as from the stretch of the Euphrates River Valley leading to the border with Syria. However, make no mistake, the momentum is clearly with the Iraqi security forces and they have the intent and capability to complete the military defeat of Daesh in Iraq. And the coalition will be, will be there in support all the way. The results since the dark days of 2014 speak for, them, for themselves. 40,000 square kilometers have been liberated. That's basically the size of Switzerland. 82,000 square kilometers in total if you include Syria. That's the size of Austria. The Iraqi security forces have prevailed in the toughest urban battle since World War II. As a result, about 4 million people are able to live their lives free from Daesh's tyrannical rule. Another million and a half have been liberated in Syria. Daesh are losing on all fronts and our partners have irresistible momentum. But in many ways, the real challenge only starts when the fighting stops. The government of Iraq, with the United Nations and others, has worked tirelessly to help IDPs return home, to restore essential services and start the slow process of recovering from the great trauma cities like Mosul have suffered. The results are pretty incredible. In Ramadi, over 330,000 people have returned home. Nearly 14,500 children are back in the classroom in, refurb in refurbished schools. There's a similar story in Fallujah, where 400,000 have returned. Housing and jobs proje projects are helping a gradual return to normality and supporting livelihoods. What always strikes me most on the streets is what the people are doing, their resilience and determination to take back their lives. The focus in West Mosul is often on the levels of destruction, but in many areas, many areas people are getting back to some degree of normality and markets are thriving. You liberate people, not bricks. Buildings can be rebuilt, lives cannot. Moving to Syria, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, with our support, are into the third month of the clearance of Raqqa. As expected, the fighting is tough, and the SDF face heavy resistance, not least from improvised explosive devices. But the SDF are making incremental gains on multiple fronts, and ISIS fighters are suffering considerable losses. This week alone, the coalition conducted more than 250 strikes on tunnel systems, IED factories, enemy rocket and mortar positions, and command and control nodes. There will be tough weeks ahead, but the enemy are suffering, uh, and the pressure is translating into progress on the ground, building by building. The deconfliction line south of the Euphrates is holding, allowing both the SDF and regime forces to remain focused on fighting Daesh. We will continue to use these deconfliction de procedures as forces continue to advance against ISIS-held areas in Syria. Now, last week I met once again with the Raqqa Civil Council and the Tabqa Civil Council. We often characterize the situation in northern Syria along sectarian lines, particularly Kurds and Arabs. That's not how they see it. There are Qawis first, working in partnership to liberate and help their towns. The councils are doing a good job, working at work acting on behalf of the people, channeling assistance to IDPs, providing security in liberated areas, and starting the slow process of restoring essential services. Each time I return to towns like Ayanisa and Tabka, there are more signs of recovery. Mambij marked the one-year anniversary of its liberation last week. The town is thriving and the market's bustling, offering an insight of what Raqqa can look forward to. 
Last week, I also met with a large group of IDPs north of Tabka, the bulk of whom had come from regime-cleared areas. I asked them why they'd not remained where they were, now free from ISIS. They were unequivocal that they wanted to come to the SDF area where they see the best prospects for their families, and, and they were effusive in their praise of how they had been treated by the SDF and by the Raqqa Internal Security Force. Finally, since this is my final briefing to you, after over a year in theatre, I want to end with a few words as a senior non-US member of the coalition. Up front, this has always felt like a coalition. The unity of the coalition is one of the greatest strengths we have. 69 nations and 44 international organizations united against a common enemy. The US provides vital leadership and fighting, fighting power, but this is a team effort. 30 nations contribute to Operation Inherent Resolve, with more than 3,800 non-US troops in Iraq today. Every nation plays a vital role, no matter what size their contribution. The recovery and success of the Iraqi security forces is built on the capacity building effort. More than 110,000 troops have been trained by coalition nations, very largely by non-US forces. Likewise, a substantial percentage of all airstrikes have been provided by nations other than the US. But it's more than that. You'll find coalition nations contributing to virtually every element of the campaign, and we couldn't do it without them. Despite all the progress, we know there's still much to do after the liberation of Mosul and Raqqa, and it will take the continued commitment of all our nations to secure the military defeat of Daesh. General, what can you tell us uh, in Syria about the continued movement of Syrian forces and Iranian militia forces toward the east, particularly around Darazor? Well, Tom, you know that the uh, regime forces have made uh, pretty steady progress over the last few months uh, east uh, towards, uh, towards the Euphrates. Uh, we had always assumed that they would do that to some degree. The regime have a beleaguered outpost in, in Darazar, so it had always been part of our assumption uh, that the regime would advance uh, east to, uh, towards uh, the Euphrates. And as you know, that's, it's for that very reason that we have these deconfliction procedures in place. Those deconfliction procedures are serving us very well uh, south of Tabka, uh, and we will of course need those, those procedures uh, later on the assumption that the regime continue to advance towards the Euphrates. Talk about the numbers you're seeing moving in that direction, and has there been any problems uh, working out areas deconfliction with those those forces heading there? So I don't want to talk about the numbers of regime forces in in the various uh, advances. You know, I, th I think the point is uh, that, it, that it's, it's hard going for them. Uh, they're, they're making ste steady headway, but it's not easy. You know, any more than it's easy for the coalition to uh, advance uh, uh, against Daesh. In terms of the, the deconfliction procedures, you know, th thus far the only area where we've need to, needed to deconflict uh, is around Mambij uh, and in the area south, south of Tabka. Uh, but I think what's really encouraging is we've got, we've got the procedures in place, we know how to uh, deconflict. We always knew that in the later stages of this campaign uh, the battle space would become more and more congested and that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, and the key is that we, we think about it in advance, we plan for it in advance, and we have protocols re ready to go. And as I say, those deconfliction procedures have served us very well uh, around Tabka, and we're confident they can serve us well going forward. Thanks, we're good. General, you had mentioned the progress being made into both Syria and Iraq, and Secretary Mattis had even mentioned that ISIS is being squeezed uh, in the area. Has that general strategy always been the plan, in other words, as um, Syrian Democratic forces make progress on Raqqa, and Iraqi forces make progress in Talaf, or that you're squeezing ISIS at the same time? Yes, I mean, I, I think that has always been the case. I mean, I think for a considerable period of time, we have recognized that to some degree, the campaign to defeat Daesh ends in what we characterize as the middle Euphrates River Valley. So essentially the area from just north of Darazar down to uh, about Haditha uh, in, in Iraq. You know, I think we've always seen that that is where, where the battle ends. 
um, uh, that, that Daesh would be squeezed into that area and that's where they would be closed out. Of course, you will recognize one of the, one of the features of working by, with and through our partners means it's not our, it's not our campaign design. We don't sit there uh, with a beautiful spreadsheet and then we fight you know, exactly as we see it. We've got to work through our partners. Um, and so we have, a, we have an overall visualization of how, how this campaign will play out. Uh, but it has to be driven by the motives and the aspirations of our partners, not least, of course, by Prime Minister Bardi, uh, the sovereign, the sovereign prime minister who, in, in Iraq, who, who, you know, he will dictate where his forces fight. But, but the expectation has always been that that would see Daesh increasingly squeezed into the, into the middle Euphrates Valley, and that is where the military defeat will be completed. Thank you. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things you said. Uh, you mentioned. The deconfliction line is holding up well uh, as that battle space becomes more congested. We haven't heard much, uh, and you talked about Manbij being one of the areas that the deconfliction line is used. There were reports that uh, coalition forces came under attack in the area around Manbij. Uh, these forces were doing an overt patrol to deter aggression at the time. Is there any more? Have there been more attacks like that? And is there any information as to who was conducting those attacks? have been instances of, of cross, uh, cross line fires. Uh, you, you refer to the most recent incident uh, where there was fire that came, came across, the, across the line uh, from some kind of uh, opposition force, we, we believe. Um, so, so incidents like that do happen. Uh, we take appropriate measures to try and minimize the, the risk of, of those, those events happening, um, but, but they, they do happen. Um, and uh, of course, all coalition forces have the inherent right of self-defense uh, at their disposal should they feel uh, the, the need. But as a by and large, um, these de deconfliction measures are serving us very well. To follow up on the other area where the deconfliction line is in effect, um, down in Antanov Garrison, we haven't heard much about it lately. Are, is the coalition still training uh, vetted Syrian opposition forces there? And is there a plan to use them uh, as the coalition kind of anticipates moving into the middle Euphrates River Valley. Hard to do now because the regime forces are kind of positioned between Antanov and that area. Is there kind of a plan being developed to get them into the fight? And is there, can you elaborate on what that is? So I guess the, you know, the reason um, you haven't heard much about the deconfliction area down in uh, uh, or the, in, in uh, Atanaf is is because it's working. I mean that's the, that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, you say so the situation is is stable. Uh, uh, every all parties understand almost if you like the rules of the, the rules of the game, uh, and that's exactly what we had wanted to be to be the case. Uh, we are still working with uh, the MAT, one of our partner forces uh, down there. They remain absolutely focused on uh, the defeated Daesh. Uh, many of those, or the bulk of those MAT fighters, come from the Middle Euphrates River Valley. So they have a very clear intention to get back to their homes to help liberate uh, their homes. So uh, is there a clear path from Atanaf uh, up to the Euphrates at the moment? Well, well as, as you indicated in, in your question, no. Clearly that is not simple to do at the moment. Uh, and we need to continue to look at the options as to how uh, the, the MAT might, su might support the fight. Uh, an avenue might open up depending, depending what the regime d does. General Jones, uh, since you mentioned Hawija and the Euphrates River Valley as the next battle after uh, Talafar, I'm wondering if you could share with us the size of, how much do you estimate the size of ISIS fighters in that area? Sorry, in which area specifically? Starting Talafar and going to Hawija and along the Euphrates River Valley. Okay, so I mean, I think the first thing I'd say, and, and you, you will recognize that predicting numbers of enemy fighters is, is an inherently difficult uh, activity. Um, uh, we know that, we know that often our predictions don't, don't prove to be accurate, and there's a whole host of reasons for that. Not least, of course, uh, Daesh keep recruiting. You know, they don't start a fight and stop recruiting. You know, they, they recruit and they train throughout, throughout a battle. Um, but, uh, but as to our, um, our current estimates, we, would, we believe that in Talafa there are about 2,000 fighters, uh, and in the middle Euphrates, somewhere between five and 10,000, something of, of that order. But as I say, you know, those, those, are, those are broad figures, and it, it is very, very difficult, despite all of our best intelligence efforts, to, to predict, that, predict those figures uh, accurately. Up, sir, talking about numbers, 
does the coalition still believe there are 2,500 ISIS fighters in Raqqa? Yeah, so, so again, our estimate for Raqqa would be about 2,500. Um, as a, you know, that's, uh, you know, we don't keep a running total. Um, that, you know, each time we conduct a strike, well, that's, that's, you know, a couple more people ticked off the list. It just, it doesn't work like that. You know, what, the, in, to some degree, the, the, you know, the numbers are slightly academic. You know, what matters is the, is the progress, because this is a battle of wills. It's not ultimately a, ba a battle of numbers. Uh, so, you know, the fact that the Syrian Democratic Forces have cleared, call it 55 to 60 percent of the city, that's what matters. It's about the incremental effect that you're having on, on the enemy, rather than, if you like, a, a, an enemy scorecard. Quick, quick, uh, on the same topic on Iraq, you mentioned in your opening remarks that the Iraqi army have fought the toughest operations since World War II. I'm wondering, how did you do this comparison? How did you compare the Iraqi operations to what we have seen in World War II? So, um, just kind of, you know, we're not we're not uh, stating absolutely factually. Uh, it, it is our assu uh, assessment. Um, if you look back through your history books, I think you'll be hard pressed to find an urban battle uh, as intense and as challenging as the Battle of Mosul until you go back to World War II. There have been plenty of intense battles, but by way of an urban fight, a, a fight through a city of a million and three quarters pe uh, people, uh, a fight that lasted. Uh, nine months, a fight against an extraordinarily determined enemy. Um, I'm, I'm, I studied history at university, I studied military history, um, but, uh, and, and I'm hard pressed to think of an example of a more challenging urban fight uh, bef uh, since the Second World War. General Townsend uh, said yesterday that popular mobilization forces are fighting in Tal Afar. I'm curious if you can provide any details on their numbers in the city, uh, where they're located in relation to partnered forces, and whether they're having any impact on the coalition's operations. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, you, you will recognize that popular mobilization forces have been out west of Mosul uh, for a good many months. So during the Mosul operation, they were, uh, if you like, isolating out, out to the, the west of Mosul. And so as the rest of the Iraqi security forces have moved around to conduct the Tanaf operation, they've been going into an area that has, has essentially been being held uh, by, the, by the popular mobilization forces. Uh, that, that's, that's the first thing to say. So I think we, we've got to recognize that the, the popular mobilization forces are in a number of areas uh, in, in the, in the Talafa zone. Uh, and the, uh, the government of Iraq, the Iraqi security forces, made the decision that the PMF would operate integrated with uh, elements of the Iraqi, Iraqi security forces rather than necessar necessarily operating uh, on their own separate axis. So, for example, they are working uh, in concert with, with, the, uh, uh, with the federal police. Now, as you know, we don't directly uh, support the popular mobilization forces. Uh, we, pr we support uh, the rest of the uh, elements of the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and so any support that we might provide to the PMF will be incidental uh, to the fact that we're directly supporting the Iraqi army, the counterterrorism service, the federal police, uh, and the like. And do you assess there are any elements of your support to other elements of Iraqi fighting forces that have been shared with, with the PMF or uh, any groups affiliated with them? Okay, so by incidental support, what I mean by that is if you conduct an airstrike, for example, uh, in support of the federal police, but the uh, popular mobilization forces are operating on that same axis, they are going to get incidental uh, assistance from it because if the federal police can't advance, nor can the PMF. But the support will be very directly in support of, in this case, the federal police or the, or the, or the Iraqi army. Um, but but you, you know, it's almost impossible to make a, a complete distinction. We're in, we're in a congested bit, bit of battle space. So as I say, it is possible that we conduct an airstrike uh, in support of a supported element of the Iraqi security forces that, as I say, incidentally, the popular mobilization forces get some indirect assistance from, but it will not be through any direct assistance. You talked about the uh, really difficult and important part being what happens after the fighting stops. And there's been a lot of talk about the need for political change in the Mosul area 
to give the population more of a stake in, in its governance. Are you, are you aware of any, or could you share with us any plan, what you know about any planned political changes that would address those concerns about governance in Mosul? So on, on Mosul first, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say about Mosul, uh, as, as I touched on, really, you know, in many ways, the, the big challenge starts when the guns fall silent. Uh, that is not the end of the road. You, you know that. We all, we all know that. Uh, and I think back to January, we were all um, cautious about what would happen in Mosul. As the Iraqi security forces transitioned across to West Mosul, leaving behind a hold force, we were uh, cautious about what would happen over the coming months. All of our militaries have experience of how challenging it can be to bring security after the fighting. Um, but actually, uh, we look back on it and the situation is much, much better in East Mosul than, than we could have hoped for. Um, security is good, is, I mean this genuinely, I mean the trust between the Iraqi police, the Iraqi army and the people is palpable. I mean, I've, I've walked the streets of East Mosul, I've gone in and spoken to stall holders, and you ask them, and they will say the same thing to you uh, as, as uh, security force commanders. You don't often get that. And what they will say is that the security in East Mosul is built on mutual respect between the security forces and the people. That's extra extremely encouraging. Um, but security is only the start of the process. You know that gov the government of Iraq, working with UNDP and others, are working very hard to bring in the stabilization projects that are needed to get the schools open, to get the water running, to do all the things that are absolutely necessary. And then you've got to build on, on the top of that uh, appropriate governance. Now map that across to uh, West Mosul. We know that the challenge is very much greater in West Mosul. As you well know, parts of the city have been very significantly destroyed. Other parts of the city have not. Again, I have walked the markets of West Mosul. Um, it's not a picture that people often paint. Uh, generally, the, the picture people show is of, of rubble. Uh, there are a great many parts of West Mosul where, where life is getting back to normal, in the same model uh, as in, in, in East Mosul. Uh, and clearly, the, the governance that you need in, in Mosul, uh, you need strong civil and you need strong uh, military uh, leadership. Uh, and really, that's, that's something I know that Prime Minister Bardi is, is very focused on. Britain's security minister, Ben Wallace, warned that terror attacks could, are, are rising. They could rise as, as ISIS loses territory. So I wondered, is, is that what you're seeing from your perspective? And then, is, this is af after the attacks in Spain, he said that. And then, is, is Raqqa still a headquarters for ISIS external operations? Or do you think they may, may have moved someplace else? That's the second question. As I said in my comments, you know, Daesh are under extraordinary pressure. They are losing on all fronts. They're losing on the battlefield. Uh, they're losing financially. The, you know, the flow of foreign fighters has slowed uh, to, to a trickle. You know, their narrative has been so very significantly discredited, partly because of the efforts of the Global Coalition, but I would argue more than that. It's been discredited by, by ordinary people. People uh, in all of our countries, in this region and beyond, who, um, uh, who um, are not willing to accept that, na that narrative. They reject that narrative. And the narrative is being drowned out by voices of, of moderation. That is much more powerful than anything a government can, can ever do. That is ultimately the route to uh, reduce the risk of, of terror attacks. But as, the tax, as it pertains to attacks coming out of uh, Iraq and Syria, all I'd say to you is this. If you're a fighter right now in Raqqa, I don't think you have got the time, the bandwidth or the security to be uh, dreaming up and plotting imaginative attacks to mount against Europe or elsewhere. Why? Because you are uh, hiding underground and you are fighting for your life. Uh, so I, I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's extremely difficult. And if I was a fighter in Raqqa right now, I know I wouldn't be focused on on, uh, on plotting attacks. I would be I'll be fighting for for my survival. And then finally, uh, you asked about uh, the degree to which Raqqa remains. Uh, I think you used the term capital of, of Raqqa. 
again, you know, we, we know it's, it's well recognized that a great many uh, fighters and indeed some of their Daesh capabilities have moved on down uh, the Euphrates to, to other places. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's, a, there's, if you like, a bit, a bit of a shift in, in their balance to other locations. But we shouldn't underestimate the degree to which there are still a significant number of foreign fighters uh, in Raqqa uh, who need to be dealt with. Uh, and as I say, I'm very confident the SDF will complete that job. Just to follow up on those questions, as far as you know, you're not aware of any planned political changes in the governance of Mosul that would prevent another ISIS from re returning? No, I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's really for Prime Minister Bardi to say uh, what his intentions are uh, for, the, for the governance of Mosul. The, you know, the, the governor of, of Mosul is, is the, uh, he is the responsible uh, individual. Um, so any, any intentions to adjust that would clearly be for Prime Minister Bardi to announce. Thank you. Sir, I wanted to know if you could share with us the extent of Iranian presence in Mosul or IRGC-backed elements in Mosul as the coalition has cleared uh, out ISIS. Are these IRGC-affiliated um, elements coming into the city? And the follow-on, sir, is um, as you progress into the next phase of stabilization operations, will coalition forces be liaising or perhaps even in some type of direct um, uh, coordination with Iranian or IRGC affiliated elements in Mosul. All the way through the Mosul battle, Prime Minister Bardi was very clear that he didn't want popular mo mobilization forces going into uh, the city. I touched on that earlier, and that's why uh, the PMF were operating uh, out to, to the west of the city. Um, and and that, that remains the case. So you will find uh, PMF out on the outskirts of the city, um, but you won't find uh, uh, them, them in the city. I'm not, I'm not going to say you aren't going to get you know, small elements. Um, it's a big city. Um, but, but you're not going to get areas of the city held by, uh, by the, the PMF. Prime Minister Bardi has always been, been very clear about that. Uh, and the other thing to say is, you know, you will recognize that the PMF are now a formal part of the Iraqi security forces. That was brought into legislation uh, late uh, last year. But Prime Minister Bardi, um, I think, uses the phrase disciplined and ill-disciplined PMF. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of risk in just kind of using a kind of blanket PMF, and it creates a kind of negative connotation. Uh, the PMF are now part of the Iraqi security forces. And forces that are moderate in their intent, and, moderate, and forces that are uh, comply with the orders of Prime Minister Abadi rather than somebody else's instructions um, uh, are, are potentially a, a positive influence. Uh, and the uh, follow-on mission as you proceed with stabilization operations in terms of liaising and um, coordinating? Oh yes, sorry, for, uh, forgive me. I didn't deliberately duck that, uh, that, that question, tricky though it is. Um, so look, I mean that you know that's really uh, a question to be asking in, in capitals, um, uh, in Washington, in London, in, in Paris. Uh, but do we have any uh, uh, um, uh, um, freedoms at the moment to conduct that coordination? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, and I confess, as a military man, I'd be pretty surprised if we received uh, those sorts of uh, instructions. But that's really a, a question for for politicians in capitals. Uh, the Israelis are so concerned th that Mosul is key to um, enabling Iran to establish an overland corridor that would link up, you've heard the rhetoric, from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea. And as a, a military professional warrior on the ground, can you address uh, the, this, the, the credibility of these concerns the, of uh, Iranian-backed continuity and land bridge that the ve the nexus is um, um, held together at in Mosul so I wouldn't kind of focus uh, your question in, in on Mosul look you know uh, we are <laughs> it sounds a bit trite but we are here as a as a military coalition to defeat Daesh not to do anything else we're here to support our partner forces to defeat Daesh there are other malign actors, there are other malign influences uh, at play, uh, but that is that is not what Operation Inherent Resolve has been brought here to, to do. But what I'd say is this: that if the 
uh, coalition helps Prime Minister Bardi in particular to uh, defeat enemies within his country, specifically Daesh, uh, if he can secure his borders, that gives him the firm platform for a secure and stable sovereign government. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, with that, um, you get side benefits along the lines that, you, that you've just described. But, uh, but I must re-emphasize, uh, and, and you know it, uh, we as a military coalition, a coalition of 30 nations involved in the fight against Daesh, we are here to defeat Daesh uh, and nothing else. Thank you. So General, so you mentioned that about 55 to 60 percent of Raqqa is now cleared. How much of that territory is now being patrolled or secured by the RISF, um, those forces, as opposed to the SDF? And can you walk through what the determination is as to when territory is handed over to the RISF as opposed to uh, SDF still patrolling it? Um, I wouldn't. I, I confess, I wouldn't put. I can't put a percentage uh, on it, but I can characterise it for you in kind of broader terms. So the bulk of Raqqa province uh, is already uh, secured uh, by the Raqqa internal uh, security force. So the areas north of the city, west, east of the city, and indeed south of the city, down down around Tabka. Uh, and the RISIF have started taking over some of the districts of, of Raqqa. Uh, once the Syrian Democratic Forces are sufficiently comf uh, confident that security is stable, then they are handing off those, uh, those outer districts to, uh, to the RISIF. So they, of course, can then concentrate their fighting power uh, closer to the front. How does that happen? Um, uh, as any good military force would when handing off to a, another force that's going to uh, protect the rear area. Essentially, it's, it's coordination. So when, when the SDF commanders feel that security is good enough, uh, they are liaised with the Raqqa internal security force uh, and, and the, the area is literally handed off. So it's really a judgment about is security good enough uh, is it stable enough? Are we confident there aren't about to be Daesh counterattacks? Uh, and then, then uh, the handoff takes place. Uh, and, and just, you know, while you talk about the Raqqa Internal Security Force, I mean, they're still a relatively new organization. Um, but worth saying, I mean, I've, I've visited their training uh, on two occasions. I've seen them out and about all over Raqqa province. Uh, and they're doing a really, really good job. Um, of that, there's, there's no doubt. They are overwhelmingly uh, Arab, the people coming in, they're, they're self, uh, self defining them as when they come into the training uh, as Arab. They are very firmly from the areas that are being liberated. It's a good job. Uh, you, get a, uh, you, you get paid, you get uniform, and you get to secure your own village because you go back and you secure the areas you're, you're from. Uh, and that's, that's very appealing. And I have to say, when, when I visit their training, I've been really struck. You know, young, uh, motivated, fit-looking uh, men uh, coming forward to be part of the Raqqa Internal Security Force. And what we see uh, on the streets is that they're doing a good job. Uh, it's low-level security, it's checkpoints, it's just maintaining, uh, it's building confidence in the, in the people. And what you also see is them treating the people with, with dignity and respect, not least because, of course, they're from their own villages. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty smart uh, way forward. Long way to go, uh, but, uh, but positive steps by the Raqqa Internal Security Force. I wanted to circle back to something you mentioned earlier. Um, you talked about the goodwill and the positive feelings, especially in East Mosul from civilians. Um, there were also a lot of reports during that campaign about civilian casualties. Um, you said that ISIS continues to recruit despite fighting battles uh, basically everywhere, that they still have territory in Syria and Iraq. Uh, are you seeing that ISIS is still being able to recruit from reclaimed territory, not just from within ter territory they hold? And how much of an impact do you think those civilian casualties have had on the goodwill or the potential uh, receptiveness of the civilians to the coalition? So we don't see evidence of ISIS uh, recruiting in, in liberated areas. Um, you know, the, the palpable sense of relief to be uh, to have your life back, even if you're in an IDP camp, uh, is is pretty powerful. When I say recruiting, what I actually mean is forced conscription. So when they were still uh, recruiting in inverted commas late in the Battle of West Mosul, that wasn't you know people walking into a recruiting office saying, "Hey, I buy into your your, uh, your narrative. I'm I'm all up for the fight." Far from it. That was people being facing the ghastly choice 
of probably being executed then and there or coming uh, and fighting, uh, you know, frankly kicking and screaming uh, for, for ISIS. That's what I, that's what I mean uh, by recruiting. Uh, in terms of the uh, civilian casualties, uh, no. Yeah, I don't see any evidence uh, when I talk to anybody that uh, the, the, the regrettable but inevitable damage that happens uh, when you liberate a city is acting as a recruiting sergeant for Daesh. Um, if, I, if I may say so, um, we, we regret civilian casualties enormously, but the, the people who focus on civilian, civilian casualties more than anybody are, are the West. And that's good because you're holding the coalition to the highest possible standards. But actually, uh, in Iraq and in Syria, people are much more accepting that because it's, it's their city being liberated. They understand what they were suffering. And they understand, therefore, the sacrifices that are required to achieve, uh, to achieve your, your freedom. And as you know, the Iraqi security forces and indeed the Syrian democratic forces go to extraordinary lengths to uh, minimize civ civilian casualties. One of the things that really characterized Mosul was protection of civilians was the very centerpiece of what the Iraqi security forces did. Uh, and we see exactly the same uh, by the Syrian democratic forces. And we, the coalition, play our part. You know, I, I, uh, I, I challenge anybody to uh, contradict me when I say this coalition uh, has the most sophisticated and the most advanced targeting process in history. We go to the very greatest lengths possible to protect civilians. We regret every single civilian casualty uh, and we would never destroy property unless we had to. But this is a war. It's not a war of our choosing. It's not a, ch a war of the choosing of the people of Iraq or of Prime Minister Badi. But if you want to liberate your towns and cities, it comes at a price. Our job is to ensure that price is as small as possible. I wonder if you can tell us if coalition advisors and artillery are playing a similar role in Talafar um, to the role that they played in Mosul, or if there are differences we can expect to see, you know, whether it's more equivalent to the role they played in East Mosul or the, or the, or the role in West Mosul. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's uh, it's pretty much the same. You know, we've picked up from from West Mosul, we've moved across to to Talafa. So in conceptual terms, it's the same. Uh, we uh, were there to provide advice and assistance and an, an enablement to our Iraqi partners. Uh, I mean, the nature of the battlefield is is slightly different, and therefore some of the tactics that may end up being used uh, may be different. But in but in conceptual terms and in terms of level of commitment to the Iraqi support security forces, uh, it's it's exactly the same. And as I said earlier, you know we would expect Talafa to be a tough fight. Uh, it's smaller, uh, a good deal smaller than, than Mosul, um, uh, but but you know for its size, we would still expect it to be a, t a tough battle. Follow up on a, on a different subject. I realize that as a, a British officer, you're not the perfect person for this question, but can you give us the usual update on what the current U.S. troop levels in OIR are um, in Iraq and Syria, whether there's been any change since the last update? Yeah, no, delighted. And uh, uh, I mean, I think it goes back to my coalition uh, points that I should be able to speak to U.S. numbers as as well as if it was a United States general officer here, because I am uh, I'm uh, the deputy commander of the coalition forces, so uh, I, I can and, and will speak confidently to you. So the the current uh, force manning level in Iraq is five five thousand two hundred and sixty two. Uh, and Syria, it's, it's 503. Uh, that has not changed for a little while. Other than forced recruiting, you know, are, are they uh, able to bring anybody in? And you know, where are the foreign fighters coming from if the whole area, if Raqqa is pretty well surrounded? I guess there's two sources of uh, recruitment. The first one is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that no foreign fighters are coming into Iraq and Syria. Um, you know, you cannot, short of uh, you know, putting up a wire around Iraq and Syria, um, it, it will remain possible for people who want to join the cause to do so. I think the point is that from the, the early days uh, where, you know, in excess of a thousand people were coming into Iraq and Syria a month, that has slowed to a trickle. Uh, why is it slow to a trickle? Well, it's slowed for a number of the reasons I've touched on already. Firstly, the brand is compromised. Uh, people don't believe in it. They don't want to come from France, Britain, Belgium, or anywhere else to come and uh, fight uh, for ISIS. 
but secondly, I guess, because of the great efforts by the global coalition uh, that sits beyond what we, the military, are doing. Uh, on the policing front, uh, on the information side, in terms of border control, not least, of course, by our NATO partner, uh, Turkey, uh, who are impacted by this more than, frankly, uh, almost any other country since they border both Iraq and, and Syria. So, so uh, we, we would assess that it's still possible for some foreign fighters to come into Iraq and in Syria, but in, in very small numbers. And I should say, therefore, by extension, it's equally hard for foreign fighters to go back home again. Uh, you, you know, the idea that they can just mooch their way through Europe uh, is, is, just, uh, is just not the case. Um, as, as far as recruiting inside the Middle Euphrates uh, River Valley, um, uh, you know, I think I'd refer you to, to what we saw in, in Mosul, uh, where um, you know, they, they are, I'm sure down there, they are still able to conduct some recruiting, but I would wager it's increasingly forced recruiting. Uh, I think I touched uh, earlier on the fact that I spoke with some uh, some IDPs last week in a in a informal settlement north of north of Tabka. It was a fascinating fascinating insight actually. About 80 of them, passionate all around me, um, and uh, you know they'd come from places like Mayadin. Uh, they they had already uh, escaped from from Daesh areas. Why? because they want to be liberated from Daesh as much as somebody from Raqqa or, or from, uh, from Mosul. In uh, continuing on, slightly on that point, are you seeing any of the fighters inside Raqqa surrendering, or are you, are you forced to uh, basically kill them all? There have been instances of uh, uh, Daesh fighters in, in Raqqa surrendering. Uh, indeed, some of the, the messaging that has been delivered to them is you know, to give them the option to surrender. Uh, they've been advised uh, how, how they uh, uh, might do that. Uh, and uh, I, would, um, I would echo what Prime Minister Bari said uh, at the weekend. He said it about Talafa, um, but the, the same pertains to... Um, uh, sorry, he said it yeah, he said about Rak uh, Talafa, but the same pertains to Raqqa. Uh, and he said uh, at the weekend, uh, surrender or die. Now, it's a pretty stark statement, but it is the truth. Uh, and the same absolutely relates uh, if you're a fighter in, uh, in Raqqa. You said that they uh, had a good job, they got paid. Who is paying the risk of salary right now, the military salary? And once Raqqa is liberated, who will continue to pay those salaries? So the Raqqa Internal Security Force are a, a vetted force. Uh, and uh, so are being paid as part of the, the, the US uh, process. Uh, you know they're, they're essentially a, a Syrian opposition force, so they're a vetted Syrian opposition force. Uh, so, so that is how they are uh, trained and equipped. Uh, and uh, clearly it's, it's for others to comment downstream in terms of uh, how, they, how that may uh, play out o over time. Because you use the word pay, technically it's a, it, they're given a stipend uh, just to be, to be uh, accurate. So General, what percentage of Talafar has been liberated right now from ISIS? In, in percentage of Talafa, so what, what day we're on? It was Wednesday today, we're on day, day three. Um, uh, I wouldn't start breaking it down as a, as a percentage. I think that would be un, unhelpful to do. You know that the Iraqi security forces had quite a lot of ground to advance before they got to the city, particularly on the eastern side. On the, on the south uh, and the west, the front line was already closer to, to the city. So what you've got going on at the moment is the Iraqi security forces closing in on the, the city from the east. They've taken uh, Kisik Junction, they've taken uh, the Twin Cities, and they're closing uh, the noose, if you like, uh, from the east very effectively. Uh, in the south and the west, the front line was already much closer. Uh, and they have broken in to the city in both the west uh, and the east during the course of the day. But I wouldn't want to start kind of breaking that down as percentages. It's early days of the battle, but the key is that they have broken into the city. General, would you call these Iranian-backed forces that are helping in the fight allies in a common cause? Uh, I'm not going to uh, comment on that uh, one way or the other. What I'm going to say to you uh, is that uh, we, the coalition, are here to support Prime Minister Bardi. Uh, we're here to support him to defeat Daesh, and we're here to support uh, his uh, Iraqi security forces, security forces that comply with his orders, uh, that take their orders from, from Baghdad. Uh, th those are the forces we're working with, and those are the forces we're supporting.
Lastly, do you think that your American counterparts are a bit too optimistic in their reports and their general uh, take on the war against ISIS overall? I don't know what U.S. reporting you're talking about because we're a coalition. Uh, it is a U.S.-led coalition. Um, I touched, touched on that. You know, this isn't a NATO operation. The United States has, has stepped up and taken the lead, and, and thank God that they have. Uh, because it, a coalition like this needs leadership, and the United States has uh, provided that leadership. So I don't view this through a United States optic. I view it through a coalition optic. So if you're referring, so I guess what you're referring to uh, are coalition reports. Uh, and so, no, I don't judge those to be unduly optimistic. Uh, we wish you a, a safe conclusion to, to your tour in Iraq and a safe return home. Thanks very much. Nice talking to you all.